Coming up on DTNS, Twitter's app store for algorithms. Salesforce declares nine to five dead. Sorry, Dolly. And a Hyundai robot with wheels that walks. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, February 10th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. We were just talking a little bit about anosmia and uh, spam and modern days of dealing with it on Good Day Internet. Uh, become a member, get that wider conversation, patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Nikkei sources say that Apple partnered with the chipmaker TSMC to develop micro OLED displays with displays built directly onto chip wafers for use in a future headset. The displays under development are less than one inch in size with mass production estimated several years away. The beta for iOS 14.5 adds accident, hazard, and speed check reporting to Apple Maps. A new report button is available in the bottom tray of maps to report incidents and voice support for Siri is available as well. An analysis by Cambridge Anniver Anniversary <laughs> University, although they probably have anniversaries also, estimates that Bitcoin mining consumes roughly 121.36 terawatt hours of electricity per year, which would make a top 30 energy consumer if it were used by country. However, for context, the researchers noted that electricity consumed in the U.S. by always-on but inactive home devices could power the Bitcoin network for a year. Yeah, I like that comparison there. It's like, yeah, that sounds bad, but then also that. Uh, following its launch in Australia, Google News Showcase launched in Argentina and the United Kingdom. Offering now includes free and paywalled articles for more than 120 UK and 40 Argentinian outlets, bringing its total to 450 publications. Twitter announced monetizable daily active users increased 27% on the year in its Q4 to 192 million, but missed analyst expectations of 193.5 million, with growth slowing for the third consecutive quarter. Twitter also said Wednesday it suspended more than 500 accounts and reduced certain hashtag visibility in India to comply with several orders from the Indian government amidst farmers' protest on agricultural reforms in the country. The Twitter accounts are only being blocked in India and don't include news media entities, journalists, activists, or politicians who have Twitter accounts. And Twitter CFO Ned Siegel said on CNBC Wednesday that people removed from its platform are not allowed to come back. And that applies to President Donald Trump, even if he ran for office again. All right, let's talk a little bit more about what Twitter is planning. Uh, Jack Dorsey has been talking a lot about decentralization over the past couple of months. What did he say this time, Scott? Yeah, it feels like every time I'm on the show, there's something new about his little idea. But on this same call with investors on Tuesday, Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey explained how its internet project, or internal project rather, called Blue Sky, uh, this is something he first announced way back in December of 2019, uh, could create a decentralized social network to give people more choice over their Twitter, Twitter experience. Uh, Dorsey said Twitter might create multiple algorithms for you to choose from and offer them alongside those made by others in a sort of marketplace. Uh, not a lot of detail beyond that, but Dorsey feels a uh, choice like this would, quote, not only help out business, but drive more people into participating in social media in the first place. Uh, decentralization could also help Twitter address concerns about moderation, neutrality, all that kind of stuff. Uh, pretty fascinating I idea. Uh, I, I still hope he does it with partners and not just a, a Twitter store with algorithm skins. <laughs> well, I mean, it sounds like it's it's a combination of both the way Twitter sees it happening. The company itself would say, all right, you might want this experience. We have enough user feedback to know that some users are frustrated with the kind of stock Twitter experience and using hashtags and maybe uh, filtering out certain uh, keywords or searching for users or topics isn't enough for you. You want Twitter built a certain way and we can do that for you. But then the company's saying, also, third-party developers might have some really great ideas, and we would welcome those algorithms as well, as long as, you know, people wanted that. Could this be something that people would potentially pay for in the future? I would think yes. Yeah, although, I mean, his focus on decentralization implies that this would be something out in the wild, right? For, for a long time, Twitter's been talking about uh, maybe we'll partner up with an existing decentralized solution, which there are a few out there like Mastodon. Uh, and I think that's a really, really interesting 
way to approach this to say, what if we decentralize Twitter and differentiated Twitter is just one of the better ways to talk with folks. But like, like you said, Scott, he thinks that would help drive more people into participating if there was a federation, so to speak, that Mastodon is that right now, but Twitter isn't part of Mastodon. So you don't have enough people using it. So it doesn't get that you know momentum that it needs. If Twitter gets behind something like that, whether it's Mastodon or something else, then suddenly it's got momentum. And if you could say like, well, what I would like is a more environmental spin on this, or I want a more libertarian spin. I you know wanted to promote things uh, that that are more ab about molecular biology, you know, and promote mm -hmm. scientists. Or I want I want to have uh, spiritual issues and Christianity promoted more. You you could have that and still everybody be participating in the same network. And to his point about moderation neutrality, if you're the one picking the algorithm, then you might have issues with how that particular algorithm works, but there would be less burden on Twitter or any other participant uh, mm -hmm. to be the person in charge of deciding what gets promoted and what doesn't, because you'd have a lot of different approaches to it. There's also well, a and subtext Especially here. when oh, yeah. there's content that is questionable, you know, and or, uh, you know, would would get somebody in legal trouble. Um, that's potentially pretty advantageous for Twitter as well. I really love the idea of being able to have, like you said, Scott, it's like a certain skin, not just what it looks like or color schemes, yeah, but yeah. something where it's like, I'm going to dive into environmental Twitter for a while. I can kind of do that if I curate my own list um, or if I have... Uh, identified all of the people in that space that I think are authorities on the subject. But what if you're trying to do some research from a starting point, having something that is helping bring voices to you that you're not going to find on your own, um, or you, or, was gonna, or it's going to take you a ton of research to be able to build something even partially like that. I, I, I love that idea. There's and especially being able to go back to, you know, regular Twitter when you want right. to, if you want to. Right, right, right. Exactly. I, that, that kind of control would be crucial. But there's a subtext here that I think is important not to miss. And that is this is him also talking to investors saying, look at all these multiple quarters of no growth. Yep. Uh, the general feeling that social media has maybe peaked out a little bit and there isn't much growth. Maybe mm -hmm. we could find growth through these other avenues. And I, I think it accomplishes that goal potentially in his mind anyway, and his other goals that he may have a little more high-minded about how social media can be better or whatever. He can maybe do those two things at once. And that's, that's kind of what I'm reading under the, under the carpet there. The Wall Street Journal sources say that the U.S. plans to have ByteDance divest TikTok's North American operations to a group, including Oracle and Walmart, remember that, we've talked about it quite a bit on the show, have been indefinitely suspended. White House spokespeople have said that the administration is developing a comprehensive approach to risks posed by Chinese apps. A formal response to TikTok's court challenge against the executive order against it is due on February 18th. A separate order restricting transactions with eight Chinese companies, including Alipay, is set to take effect next week as well. So look for clarification from the administration on its approach to China, not just ByteDance or TikTok, then. Yeah, uh, this makes sense to me. Uh, I was never convinced that TikTok was our priority, uh, and so I wasn't quite certain why we went after TikTok first, uh, other than it was really popular. It didn't seem to be the most likely vector for a threat. Uh, I, I wonder about WeChat. There, there are more questions there, but it seemed more punitive uh, than, than it did uh, strategic. So I will be very interested to see what the administration comes up with here to say, all right, we want to have a more comprehensive strategy that really assesses things based on how likely they are to cause a problem and go after those. Uh, my guess is they're, they might still pursue something with TikTok. Uh, the Wall Street Journal article mentioned saying, okay, your data is required to be stored in the U.S. if it's collected from the U.S., which would be an unsettling precedent. But if they, they can make a case of only in this case because of these reasons, I, I could see something like that continuing rather than saying you have to sell TikTok, especially because China has said they will not allow ByteDance to sell off TikTok. That's not a solution that that they'll go along with. Whereas because China requires companies to store data in China, I'm guessing they'll have a harder time justifying not going along with some plan like that. Yeah, I also, I also was just thinking the other day, like 
TikTok not. And I, I felt like you did at the time. The TikTok TikTok wasn't the threat that maybe everybody wanted us to think it was, or you know, whatever your stance on that stuff was. But I'm also not that surprised that China wants to hold tightly to that algorithm. That's the thing that makes TikTok work, and it's the reason I use the service, despite all of its "quote unquote" real or or not real security concerns. It knows what I want to see, and it feeds that to me in a way that other services just plain don't do a very good job of. So if I were them, I wouldn't want to give that up either, and that part doesn't surprise me. Got an email from Chris to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Uh, Chris said, I wanted to ask about Starlink. They opened up pre-orders, and living in rural Arkansas, I put down my 99 bucks. However, we pay more than that monthly for really crappy wireless service, but do you guys— have a feeling as to whether or not I screwed up or not. He was like, he, it sounds like he got excited, put down the 99 bucks and then said, wait a minute, what have I done? This is a bad idea. <laughs> uh, I basically told him like, well, it's a refundable deposit. You're, you're probably okay. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if it actually comes to your area. And, and then when it does, uh, is it any good? But I don't think he screwed up. I think that's a rational thing to do. Here's the rest of the deal. Uh, SpaceX's Starlink is now in public beta. It has opened up to pre-orders for potential customers of its internet service, which is delivered by satellite. $99 deposit, like Chris said, lets you get a target date for coverage. Now, depending on where you are, that target date could either be 2021 or 2022. Uh, you also have the option to link to your credit card so that it can charge you your $99 and, and refund it that way. Uh, the Starlink kit itself, which includes a Wi-Fi router and a dish, is $499. Starlink says pre-orders for that are fully refundable and may take six months to fulfill. Placing a deposit does not guarantee you service. Starlink's public beta started last year in Canada, the UK, and the US, has more than 10,000 customers on board, uh, getting service from more than 1,000 satellites now in orbit. Keep that number in mind, 1,000 satellites. Starlink has also been provisionally approved to get $885.51 million out of a total $9.2 billion that's being split among 180 different entities. Starlink's just one of them. They're getting $885.51 million in U.S. federal funds over 10 years to provide broadband to underserved areas. However, the Fiber Broadband Association and the NCTA Rural Broadband Association have both filed an objection with the FCC claiming Starlink will fall short of required capacity in 2028 and that the funding should not be finalized. Starlink will need to provide, in order to meet the requirements of the funding, 100 megabits per second download and 20 megabits per second upload to 642,925 underserved locations by 2028. The opposing ISPs hired a consulting firm called Cartesian to determine that based on public information, it believes Starlink users would not get their full bandwidth by that point because of congestion. Cartesian based its estimates on an average peak usage by 2028 of 15 to 20 megabits per second because of things like 4K streaming becoming popular. Cartesian modeled that usage across SpaceX's 12,000 satellites. It's got 1,000 now needs to have 12,000 by 2028. So if they don't get all 12,000 launched, that would be another impact. The FCC is currently evaluating Starlink's technical claims before finalizing approval of funding. So a lot of things going on here. Starlink needs to get enough people to put down deposits that it can say, okay, we've got a decent user base and it needs to get that federal funding so that it can say, all right, and we can like push out into these rural areas, which will be one of our big selling points. Yeah. This is a uh, it, it, lot of moving parts that need to fall in the right places for people not to be really upset at the end of this, right? You need the funding to get 12,000 satellites up there. You got 1,000. I mean, you got to get a lot more than 1,000 per year to reach 12,000 by 2028. But if there's a congestion issue, and imagine what kind of internet usage we're going to be talking about in 2028, uh, you know, the ISPs might not be wrong here. And at that point, the money has been spent, and who loses? The people like Chris with rural internet who say, well, shoot, this didn't work. Yeah. yeah. Although, also I mean, that's the one, one, less than $1 billion out of $9.2 billion, with the rest being split around 180 entities. Well, it's probably those other 179 entities that are complaining. They're part of that association. It's like, we don't want that money going to SpaceX. That's a lot going to one company. Right. I was just reading a thing about securities laws and how they work with people putting money down for a thing that isn't out yet 
Mm. And that's more complicated than I thought. I don't know how that works in this particular scenario, but the one I was I was watching was about a car where they a little bit like Tesla, where they promised a car, you put a certain amount down, and then they have to deliver that car, but that money has to go into escrow basically and not be yep. used for day to day operations. I'm sure they have that all taken care of because this is a big deal and a lot of people involved. So my guess is you're safe with your ninety nine bucks. And like Tom said, if it's starting to look grim, just yank it out. Hey, folks, if you want to talk about Starlink or anything else, uh, get in our Discord. Charlotte just joined. Uh, Charlotte's in there uh, about to drive a bus. Uh, but talking to some other folks in the DTNS audience, you can join Charlotte and everybody else by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Scott, tell us what Facebook's up to these days. Sorry, I was on mute and didn't know it. Hey, <laughs> let's talk about Facebook because Facebook's in the news again. Big shocker, everybody. Facebook's announced it will uh, test or will test reducing the distribution of political content in its news feeds. A small percentage of people will experience the test in Brazil, Canada, Indonesia, and thankfully the U.S. Facebook will try several ways of ranking political content and monitor what effect the different approaches have. COVID-19 content and content from official government agencies will not be affected by these changes. Pew Research Center uh, study they just did shows that 33% of people in the U.S. get their news from Facebook. Facebook says political content is about 6% of what people in the U.S. see. I don't know if I trust that number. Uh, I, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm trying it, not to go, ah, that's not true. We're, I, we're buried I be in honest, it. But. Sarah and I were talking about this in Discord earlier, and and we we convinced ourselves Justin was on today because hashtag portal to hell, hashtag hell portal <laughs> is the only thing that applies to this story. Like, I, I get <laughs> that uh, a lot of political content seems to be linked to making people more radical, and there's a few numbers out there that show that. But there hasn't been a lot that's really convincing that, oh, if you let the company in charge decide which political information should be downgraded, that will make things better. I, this this feels more like something Facebook would do because it gets them good headlines than something that we know will solve the problem. I don't know. Maybe it will. Uh, you, you know, you can you can throw things uh, at a wall and hope to hit the dartboard. And maybe maybe you will. Uh, I don't know if this means Facebook's good at darts. <laughs> yeah, it's also, I don't know. I mean, the idea that a lot of people get their news primarily from Facebook is just, it's somewhat mind boggling, but hey, that's that's just the way it is. Because some news is intentionally misleading. Not all news, uh, and I'm not singling anybody out, but some of it is. One would think, okay, well, if Facebook is one of the platforms or the platform that you as a uh, misinformation news person is trying to share with the largest amount of people. You're going to get pretty creative about the way that you share that kind of thing. Um, Facebook saying, yeah, we don't, we need m less political content on our platform. Is not necessarily going to mean that it just goes away because Facebook decided to change an algorithm that isn't going to catch how people might get smart about it in the future? But yeah, I don't know. It's kind of Facebook saying, well, this doesn't work, so we're just going to make it go away. And that's not a very good solution either. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe take a page out of what Twitter's talking about that we mentioned earlier. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Give us an app store for our Facebook experiences. So many skips. Uh, well, good news from Salesforce, everybody. We don't have to work anymore. Oh, well, really? That's Oh, yeah, awesome. it's, uh, it's only partially true. Salesforce <laughs> posted to its blog Tuesday a headline that got a lot of attention titled, The 9 to 5 Workday is Dead. So Salesforce is going to give employees three categories to choose from for their work schedule while still being employees at Salesforce. They don't just get to kick up their feet. They still have to work. But Flex, one of the options, would see employees coming in one to three days per week into the office. Salesforce has a huge, huge headquarters uh, in San Francisco, but they have employees all over the world. The other two categories are fully remote. You don't go anywhere at all. You just work remotely and office-based. Office-based is expected to be the smallest category with employees like building maintenance or other roles that just require them to be in the office five days a week. So that part makes sense. Sometimes you just can't be remote, but Salesforce is saying the majority of our people can and have, and we don't want to change it back. Yeah, we, we were wondering all last year, like after the COVID is over, uh, how much of this work from home will stick? Uh, and this isn't necessarily the typical response, but we have a response from a very large company saying what we're going to do is let a lot of people stay home. 
Uh, I, I know some companies have already made work from home permanent, but Salesforce is, is interesting saying, we are going to let you pick the category. I imagine you have to pick it with your boss. Obviously, if you're in the maintenance uh, department, they're not going to let you work from home. You, you have to come in and do that job. But but yeah, they're, they're going to have these multiple categories. And it shows that this great experiment we were all forced into has certainly had effects that you now realize, oh, working from home isn't trying to shirk your duties. Working from home can absolutely work in various roles, but also we may have some roles that really do need to be in the office mm -hmm. a couple of days a week. Uh, and that that's what I think is kind of interesting about this from Salesforce is they didn't say it's fully remote or in the office. They said there's also this category of like, man, you, you need to be around sometimes to mix with each other and do some face-to-face -face brainstorming or whatever. Uh, but there's some roles that you only need to do that a couple of weeks, a couple of days a week. And if you only need to do a couple of days a week, well, then we don't need as much office space for you. So stay at home the rest of the time. There's been some some shifts in the video game business. The uh, I'm trying to remember the the massive company that really did it the biggest, and then I can't find it. I was trying to find it before you finished. But basically, you're starting to see uh, in that environment some permanent policies in place for work at home plans, whether we're in the pandemic, post pandemic, and beyond. And I think that's a really interesting shift, especially for a business where collaboration and sort of constant feedback and bouncing ideas around an office is kind of the norm uh, to see some of these companies shift that way has been really interesting. And I mean, Salesforce is, um, is monstrously big. So this is, is a, it's a, it's a big thing. I mean, whether or not we, this is all positive or things don't get reversed down the road, who knows? Like, we don't know. It's just too right. soon to say we're still learning from this. We're still trying to figure out what's what. Um, but it seems like they're striking a decent balance for the time we're in. I know the uh, the cynical reaction is, well, they just want you to work all the time. That's why they're saying nine to five is dead. But Salesforce did say a lot of the right things, which is with home child care, with daily appointments, doctor's appointments, you know, uh, working from home gives you flexibility. So it's not all necessarily like we just want to work you to death. It's all it, it can be. We actually want to take account the fact that between nine and five, you sometimes need, need to do things that aren't work. And what we care about is you get your work done. Yeah. And for anybody who's never seen the Salesforce Tower in San Francisco, it's massive. It's literally the largest building in the entire city. And there's some large buildings. It is big. Now, Salesforce isn't the only tenant of the entire building, but there are there's that building. You think, oh, wow, well, you know, it houses a lot of office workers, you know, on any given day. OK, well, cut that by a third or a quarter, right? I, you know, even conservatively, you have some space that is not being used on a pretty regular basis. I know this applies to a lot of cities um, and just buildings in general all over the world. Some of them will kind of go back to the old way of doing things, as you mentioned, Scott. I mean, so, some will. It depends on the business. But for those that don't, what can we do with that space? Considering a lot of housing shortages in a lot of different places, I think uh, some 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 uh, government officials should get creative. Yeah, condo that stuff. Yeah. yeah, money to be made, and I don't know, maybe <laughs> right. some good to be done. Some ve very large living room you have, Sarah. Yeah, it used to be a really big conference <laughs> room. Yeah. I want the kitchen. <laughs> it used to be a conference room. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> yeah, really bad. The main one. Uh, Hyundai unveiled the Transforming Intelligent Ground Excursion Robot Experiment, Tiger X1 for short, on Tuesday. The concept builds off of Hyundai's previous Elevate walking vehicle. You might have remembered. It showed it off at CES back in 2019. It can transition from electric four-wheel drive operation to four-legged walking for more uneven or inaccessible terrain. Each leg has six points of articulation between the meal and the chassis with more omnidirectional design that can rotate and move in any direction. So forward, backward, side to side. The X1 has 28 motors and 28 position sensors, including on its wheels, unmanned scientific exploration, payload delivery for remote locations, emergency services like delivering medicine or equipment to the site of a natural disaster, all potential use cases. Yeah, it seems cool. I, I was looking at this video earlier and thinking, these are the ones I want. These are the robots I want. I don't, I don't need bipedal, creepy human ones. I want, like, <laughs> stuff that can get bot. work done. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I want one I can send out, I don't know, on some hard job somewhere and know that its weird tires are going to move around in ways that will make it survive and get this horrible job done and come back and park itself, and that's all I have to deal with it. I don't have to talk to it. I don't have to try to... Reckon, you know, or uh, uh, 
uh, wrestle with this idea that it sort of looks like me and that's weird and have all those disconnects. Let's just go forward where our robots are all misshapen and just look like stuff we already have. They're just really smart at getting what they need to get done and not great at being human-like. I don't want that yep. anymore. Uh, I, I've seen this compared to the size of a cat and the size of a uh, rollerboard luggage. Uh, I don't know who has very large cats or very small rollerboard <laughs> luggage, uh, but it does seem a little closer to the luggage than it, it does to the cat size. But it's not huge. It's not car size. Uh, right. And so this could be carried by by a large drone and dropped off. Again, another more more search and rescue uh, applications to this because again, More it could be placement it could roll around. of a monolith in the Utah desert. <laughs> yeah, see, <laughs> roll in, place the monolith, roll out, do some exactly. walking to get across That's the brilliant. uneven yep. terrain. Yeah, I love I it. All right, let's check out the mailbag. This one comes from Josh who says, Hi, team. What is your view on the big three Apple, Google, Amazon struggling to get into the gaming space? Amazon. Their Crucible was unreleased and put back in beta. No plan right now. Yes, they launched Luna, but it's been under the radar for the last couple months. Uh, for Google, I'm sure the death watch for Stadia has started, and with the various changes happening, the model of subscription plus purchase coming into question. For Apple, Apple Arcade launched. Been pretty much no news since then. Is it a problem of this being a different industry or too many big studios already available? Um, this is so interesting. It's such a really great question because... Uh, you know, Microsoft is already obviously 20 plus years now uh, heavily invested in the Xbox side. Certainly the PC gaming side was already part of that. But but don't forget, Microsoft struggled for years to make PC gaming their own thing, despite the fact that Windows is the platform the games are being written on. So while they fumbled about with that, you know, people like Valve and others would come by and have extreme success. Uh, on PC, despite the fact that the owners of the operating system couldn't seem to do it themselves. So I guess what I'm trying to say with that is these companies aren't necessarily suited to do this very well. Gamers are also notoriously, um, what's the word, suspicious of somebody kind of sneaking into that industry and saying, hey, we can do this too. Check out our cool thing. Stadia is a good example of this. Like they tried to play like, we know what gamers want, and this is what they want. And it turns out we kind of don't want what they say we want. And we also don't like being told that we want what we want. Um, it's a it's a weird, unique thing, I think, to that. Other businesses, too. But that business in particular is very, very skeptical of anybody who wants to swoop in and, and, and you know, be the new leader in the space. Um, Amazon, I think, has the best chance here. Amazon's doing okay with Luna. It's still not even in full release yet, so we'll see. Uh, and I think they have a good model for Luna. Luna is a little closer to what people want, a Netflix-style subscription service to a bunch of video games with some nice add-ons. Uh, Crucible was a mess, absolutely. They've got their MMO people are excited about, but they're not shutting that stuff down um, the way that Stadia just shut down all their internal development without releasing a game. Uh, I, think, I think Amazon may not know what they're doing entirely yet. I think they have a lot of money, and when they commit to a thing, they seem to stick it stick it out until they're 100% sure it's not going to work out. And I can't say that for Google. In Apple's case, they've always just been weird. It's like dip their toe in with Pippin all those years ago, and it was terrible, but they did it. And then this whole talk of metal with Macs, and you're going to be able to render out stuff better on, on Macs a few years ago. And it kind of worked, but it wasn't that big a deal. External GPUs, all this stuff. Uh, M1, they're making new claims about gaming performance, that sort of stuff. Uh, they, Unless they really, really wanted to put their heart in it, I don't think anything comes of that either in terms of leadership. But in Apple's case and in somewhat Google's case, they kind of don't care because where the biggest money is being made in gaming right now is in mobile. And they already own the platforms where that's happening. They already have the stores and they get the percentages and they're already multi-billion dollar revenue generators just by being the phones you're using. So in a way, they're already leading this thing. We, it's just not on the consoles or the PCs that this, this emailer might be thinking of. So I don't know that these any of these three will ever be your core gamer brands that you look at and go, oh man, can't wait to get the new Apple killer box 2.0 or whatever. That's, I just don't see that ever happening. And the same goes for Amazon and Google. However, uh, that's okay. Because they're providing stuff on another end of it. If anything, it's Amazon who's playing catch up here because they don't have that mobile footprint, right? They don't have that platform. And so until they have something closer to that, 
uh, closer to what they have with the Echo, not with gaming, but, you know, kind of that ubiquity, then maybe they'll do better. So, so Josh, I'm just what I'm saying is don't sweat it too much. These guys are all going to do fine. And in a lot of ways, they're already top of that game. Apple and Google kind of snuck in and stole it in a weird way, if you want to look at it that way. I, I want to add one, one quick thing, uh, Josh. Also, keep in mind, there's a bias to the coverage you're seeing. If this looks like a service is going to fail, you're going to see that headline everywhere. If it looks like the service is doing exceptionally well, you might see that headline everywhere. But if the service is just doing okay, you're not going to hear anything about it. So no news right. probably means things are going all right. Yeah. <laughs> if you have questions like Josh did, you're going to get great answers from people like Scott Johnson. So keep them coming. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We also want to shout out patrons at our master and our grandmaster levels. Today they include Tim Deputy, Linnell Lane, and Dr. X17. Scott Johnson, always a pleasure, my man. Tell folks where they can keep up with the rest of your work. Well, sure. If you like uh, gaming content and other stuff like that, go no further than frogpants.com. But if you're looking for some closure on a recent story arc that I did with the Fred and Can comic strip, uh, I did that. So you can finally rest easy. Everyone's going to be okay. Go check it out at fredandcan.com. And as always, you can leave me feedback or tackle me over on Twitter. I'm at Scott Johnson. I knew Can would. <laughs> we love patrons that stick with us. That's why we're happy to offer Patreon loyalty rewards. You can get a unique sticker or mug or T-shirt or hoodie sent to you every three months as long as you stay a patron at a certain level. Each one has unique art from Len Peralta featuring the DTNS seven-year anniversary logo with either Roger or Sarah or myself. Get the details at patreon.com slash DTNS. Did you know we were live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 21.30 UTC? If you didn't know, now you know. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And guess what? We're going to do this all again tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Come on over and talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>